it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Walt Koenig. He's going to talk tonight about cooperation and conflict in the world of acorn woodpeckers. Dr. Koenig was a research zoologist at Hastings Reservation, which is a, um, a field station located in the upper Carmel Valley and run by the Museum of Vertebrates, Vertebrate, easy for me to say, zoology at UC Berkeley from 1982 to 2008. He subsequently was a senior scientist at Cornell Lab of Ornithology in Ithaca, New York. He retired in 2016 and returned full-time to the Upper Carmel Valley where he currently studies acorn production by California oaks, which is part and continues to contribute to the acorn woodpecker study. So it's especially interesting, I think, for me to see the kind of long-term study. I'm excited about hearing your overtime experience with those acorn woodpeckers. Over to you. Uh, okay. Well, hello, everyone. Um, yeah. Let me, while, while, you're, uh, while you're sharing your screen there, Walt, I'm going to tell everybody uh, he, that he's going to take um, questions at the end of the presentation. So if you have questions, um, type them in the chat, and we'll do that at the end. OK. I'm getting here. I think that worked. Do we have two acorn woodpeckers up there? Yep. Yeah. Okay. And they're handsome. Ah, so there. Okay, let's get that out there. You are sharing your screen. Good. I think we're okay. Oops. Let's go back to there. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Walt Koenig. Um, and uh, as, as mentioned, I've been living up here in Upper Carmel Valley since uh, for a long time, uh, basically since I was a grad student back in the day. Uh, and even when I was in the lab of ornithology at Cornell, I basically ran off and came back here to do my research. So uh, much to my wife's chagrin, I never really moved to upstate New York, though Ithaca is very nice and I can highly recommend it. But as I uh, kept telling people over and over again, it's not California. Uh, anyway, so I get to uh, tell you about acorn woodpeckers, which I'm sure you're all familiar with because they're probably one of the more common birds uh, in any oak woodland in California. Uh, so we'll start with what they look like and here they are. Let's see, how do I get rid of that? I wonder, I don't know. Hmm. Okay, somehow. I keep getting this stuff. Yes, yes. Okay, so we have a male and a female. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware of that, you can tell the sexes apart uh, because the males have these wide, the red coming all the way up to the white on the forehead. The females have this black band in between the white on the forehead and the red on the crown. Uh, that's true for all the birds except fledglings. For the first several months of their lives, uh, they all look like males. I have no idea why, and I don't think anybody else does either. It's actually quite unusual for young birds to all look like males instead of females, but in acorn woodpeckers, they do. And uh, when they molt, usually around September, uh, that's when they gain their full adult plumage and turn into males and females. Okay, let's see, how do I get back here? Okay, uh, acorn woodpeckers have been of interest to Californians for a long time. Uh, the Native Americans were quite fond of them. Uh, they would catch them with these, they had special nets like this that they used to catch them. Uh, they'd put them in front of the cavity, the roosting cavities of the birds, uh, which is basically the same way that we catch them. Uh, so, uh, interestingly enough, we uh, 
do that pretty much the same way they've been doing it for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Uh, what they used their crown feathers for was they wove them into these fabulous baskets here, along with quail top knots and often magpie feathers, though I don't see any here. And some of them used their, uh, their, their skins for other really fabulous kinds of ornaments, uh, which you can find if you go to some of the better museums out there. Uh, there now, there are things which uh, are well, they're birds that are well known for drilling holes in, in a lot of places, not the least of which are uh, buildings, not always to the owner's, um, sometimes to the owner's chagrin. Uh, here's one of my favorite granaries down here. It's the old main library at Stanford University. Uh, they really like these Spanish tiles. They'll store the acorns there. And they, of course, store the acorns in any wood that they can find. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's some great literature about them. This is one of my favorite quotes. The acorn peckers are native aristocrat. He is unruffled by the operations of the human plebs in whatever disguise. All people are the same to him. Wigwams, haciendas, or university halls. What matter such frivolities if only one may go calmly on with the main business of life? which is indubitably the hoarding of acorns. So that's, uh, that's what they do. Uh, it's from Dawson a hundred years ago, almost today. Okay, so we're going to be looking at them at, the, at my primary study site, uh, which uh, is, as Larry mentioned, this Hastings Natural History Reservation. It's uh, one of the natural reserves run by the University of California. Uh, they, which are spread, well, you can't, I can't claim that that's all across the state, but there are many of them. There are about 40 of them now. And uh, this one is right there in the upper Carmel Valley, just inland here from the Monterey Peninsula. And so here we are, here's the Monterey Peninsula and Monterey Bay. And uh, we're gonna zoom in here to Carmel Valley and go up about 26 miles, and then there we are. Uh, this is actually looking off from uh, the reserve off on the adjoining ranches. Uh, it's a beautiful place, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with the lovely oak woodlands of California, of which I've been lucky enough to be able to live now for many, many years, and which I just couldn't stay away from even when I was in the beautiful uh, middle of the gorges of upstate New York. Well, if you look around in this habitat and uh, around there, around Reading too, you can, it's not too hard to find uh, one of these fabulous granaries that acorn woodpeckers build. Uh, here's one here with a bird on it. Uh, as I'm sure most of you are aware, what happens is that every fall they harvest acorns off the trees and store them in these holes, which they have drilled into the bark or dead wood of these trees. And uh, these trees, they, the holes, they're used over and over again. And, uh, you know, they kind of disintegrate with time so that the birds have to keep building, have to keep drilling more and more just to keep up with how many are lost. Uh, and here's a little video of one storing acorn. And in each hole, he jams a nut. Nice thing here is you can see this shock wave that, as the bird hammers on this acorn. His head whacks into the nuts with so much force, it would knock a human unconscious. Yeah, that's actually not true uh, because of the allometry of the, of, the, of the very small woodpecker compared to the, the head of a human. They, in fact, are experiencing just about the same forces that humans are known to be able to exist without hurting themselves. Uh, but it mostly has to do with just the smaller size of the birds, birds' heads. Okay, uh, we can move on. If, at this point, I think they start chasing squirrels, which uh, they like to do a lot too. Okay, so one of the most important things I have to mention uh, because it's a great, I, great sort of 
old wives tale that uh, is going to outlive me no matter what I do, uh, which is that they do acorn woodpeckers do actually eat the acorns. Now, if you pull out an acorn from a granary, uh, you are not unlikely, depending on the year, on the season and the year, to find a uh, one of these nice little weevil larvae or some other larva inside the acorn that may or may not have eaten a fair amount of the cotyledon. Uh, but that's and if a woodpecker comes across one of them, uh, they're more than happy to eat them. Uh, they do actually flycatch, of course, all the time. Uh, insects are great food, uh, but in terms of storing acorns, they are storing them in order to eat the acorns, not uh, for the grubs that live inside them. Uh, this is something which we, we acorn woodpecker biologists know fondly as the grub theory. And uh, as I say, it was, it's going to far outlive me, even though it was disproved somewhere around 100, <clears throat> excuse me, over a hundred years ago, and you can disprove it anytime you want simply by watching an acorn woodpecker pull out an acorn and eat it. Because if you do that, you'll be able to watch them actually eating parts of uh, the acorn itself. Uh, they are not just going after whatever might be living inside them. And uh, another way uh, you can tell this, I still don't know how I get rid of this. How do I get rid of that? Does that show up? Oh, well. Uh, if no, you no, listen no, really no. carefully, you can hear those woodpeckers sort of singing to themselves. Loves to eat them acorns. Acorns, what I loves to feed on. Bites the little caps off. Nibbles on the cotyledons. And uh, that's how you know they're actually in it for the acorns. All right, a little bit about acorn woodpecker ecology here. First of all, their distribution. Uh, we're, of course, here on the West Coast, and they go all the way up. Uh, they are expanding their range, really. There, there are a few spots over here east of the Sierras that they've, uh, Susanville, there's a nice population over there where they've actually made it across the Sierras. Uh, they're heading north slowly. They've made it across the Columbia River, and there are a few in Washington. And the Oaks, of course, keep going all the way into Vancouver. And uh, so someday they may actually make it up into Canada. Uh, but this is not the main part of their range. The main part of their range is down here in the Southwest. Uh, they're in the hills of Arizona and New Mexico, uh, Big Bend, and then all the way down through the Sierra Madres in Mexico and into Central America. And there's even a couple of populations in South America in the Colombian Andes. Uh, they were again, they're oaks. There is a species of oak that lives in the Columbia Andes. Uh, there is no place that acorn woodpeckers live where there aren't oaks. Uh, but the relationship between acorn woodpeckers and oaks is actually a little more interesting than that. And I have to show you this. Um, this these are data from Christmas bird counts. And if you look at Christmas bird counts in the West Coast, and figure out how many species of oaks there are in them and look at the mean density of acorn woodpeckers based again on the surveys that people do on Christmas count. You see a couple of interesting things. One is the density increases with increasing oak species. The more oaks there are, the more woodpeckers there are. Uh, but the really interesting thing here is that if you look at where there's one species of oak, uh, the density is really about the same as where there aren't any oaks, which basically means that you're looking at some really lost acorn woodpecker. Uh, the distributional limit of acorn woodpeckers is basically set by areas where there are at least two species of oaks, not just one species of oak, uh, which is why, for those of you who are familiar with the Bay Area, there are no acorn woodpeckers on the Berkeley campus. And uh, there really aren't any acorn woodpeckers in Oakland either, uh, because there's only one species of native oaks found there, coast live oak. And uh, the acorn woodpeckers just can't really make it in those areas. Why is that? Well, we think it's because the acorn woodpecker reproductive success is highly dependent on the acorn crop 
And as I mentioned uh, before the beginning of my talk, uh, speed, different species of oaks do not mast synchronously. So if you have only one species of oak in the area, then the odds of it having a really bad year where there basically aren't any acorns is pretty good. You're basically going to, the birds that are living there are going to experience a acorn crop failure every three or four years. And they appear just not to be able to make it when they don't have acorns that frequently. If there are two species of oaks, it kind of cut back that frequency significantly because if one species isn't producing acorns, there's a good chance the other one is. And so in those areas, and the more species of oaks you have, the less likely uh, a failure, a total crop failure is likely to come around. And therefore the birds just do much better uh, and really can't make it unless there are at least two species of oaks. Uh, these are data from Hastings down here. Each one of these is a year. And uh, so we census survey the acorn crop every year. Uh, we've been doing it for a long time. And when it's a really good acorn crop, not only do the birds breed very well, they produce a lot of offspring in the, the following spring, but acorn woodpecker is one of the uh, most dramatic species of California birds that will even and sometimes even breed in the fall if there's a really good acorn crop. Uh, the latest young babies I've ever banded at Hastings, I banded one on November 1st once. Uh, and uh, so if it's a good acorn crop, they can start a nest in uh, late August or September. And uh, those young are then fledging in October or even the beginning of November. Okay, but the fact is that isn't really why I have been studying acorn woodpeckers since I was in grad school, which was, well, longer ago than I like to admit. Uh, it's because of their social behavior. They're cooperative breeders. They live and breed in family groups of up to 15 individuals. And being cooperative breeders puts them in a rarefied group of animals, uh, including in North America, one of the few other species are the, is the red cockaded woodpecker in the Southeast. Uh, they're, oh, in Florida scrub jays, not Western scrub jays for some reason, uh, but Florida scrub jays, this disjunct population of scrub jays, now its own species, of course, considered its own species, but it wasn't for a long time. Uh, in Florida, they're cooperative readers, but uh, you know the other populations of scrub jays are not. Uh, Australia has a lot of cooperative readers. These are the fairy wrens, almost all of which, I think maybe all of which are cooperative readers. Africa is a good number. This is uh, the white-throated beater. Uh, and uh, also there are some mammals, uh, such as meerkats, which uh, you may or may not know much about. Uh, I've never seen one, but uh, they're pretty interesting animals, I have to admit. Uh, so to study cooperative reading uh, takes a lot of effort because you have to know who everybody is. You're interested in who birds are, what they're doing, and why they're doing it. Uh, to do that for woodpeckers, you got to climb trees. So here I am back in my youth, climbing up to a woodpecker nest. Uh, that's the cavity, the entrance that the birds are going in and out of. This is the hole that we have uh, sawed away down below it so that we can reach inside and pull out what's inside the cavity, which in this case is a pretty young baby uh, right there. And here I am a not too long ago, uh, climbing to yet another tree. Uh, we, uh, basically, I consider myself, at least during all those years I was studying acorn woodpeckers, to be a glorified tree climber uh, because I spent a lot of time up in trees and uh, had a good time. Though, as I mentioned, I think I'm, I'm lucky uh, that I never fell uh, because those trees, uh, is, there's a famous quote uh, about valley oaks, which is what both these are actually. 
Um, and it sort of applies to several other species of California oaks as well, which is that uh, they tend to grow for 100 years and then they die for the next three or 400 years. Uh, and, uh, you know, they lose limbs all the time, they fall apart. And uh, what you don't want is to be underneath one of those limbs uh, when one of it falls on you. Uh, it, it, uh, it would hurt. All right. Oh, and climbing here, I have a little video. This isn't of me climbing, but it's, I think, drone footage of our, one of our grad students climbing to one of these woodpecker nests at Hastings, just to give you a feel for what it could be like getting up to some of these nests. Uh, this one, yeah, I really didn't want to have to climb up this dead limb. Uh, so they managed to uh, get up there using this ladder. Uh, the point being to put color bands, uh, there's a Fish and Wildlife Service band and then a nice uh, color band there so that we can identify uh, these birds subsequently, know who they are without actually having to catch them again. All right, but uh, it's uh, getting up to the nests and banding the birds is not the only part of the study. We uh, have had literally hundreds of field assistants over the years who have spent untold numbers of hours watching the birds, censusing birds, surveying who's in the groups, who's not there anymore. And uh, then I have a colleague uh, here, Joey Haydock up at Gonzaga University now, who's one of my postdocs back in the 90s, who has been doing the parentage analysis and, all, and a lot of the genetic work uh, that uh, we now uh, are able to bring to bear to what's going on in this population. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what the group, what these groups look like. I mentioned that, uh, oh, well here, by the way, I should show this beforehand. This is a young, a fledgling acorn woodpecker. Uh, you can tell them, eh, they do a lot of dumb things, uh, but you can tell them because they have dark eyes, uh, adult acorn woodpeckers, almost invariably have white eyes. Why? I mean, most birds have dark eyes. Why do acorn woodpeckers have white eyes? You got me. I have absolutely no idea. And as I mentioned, why young acorn woodpeckers, fledglings all have adult male plumage. Uh, again here, male plumage, not female plumage. Whether they're males or females, I again have absolutely no idea. As I like to say, somebody really needs to study these birds someday. Uh, they do a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, okay, where was I? We we're gonna talk about group composition. So groups can consist of up to 15, actually this year, right at this moment here at Hastings, we have, I think two groups that have even more than 15 birds. First time that's ever happened. Uh, most groups, however, are in the four to five to six range. Uh, but there are a lot of groups that are simply a pair of birds. What's going on? Okay, well, this is a complicated, a relatively complex group, large group, okay? Uh, it consists of a breeding core of individuals. We have, in this case, four male, what we call co-breeders, and two females that we either call co-breeders or joint nesting females. We call them joint nesting because they lay their eggs in the same nest cavity. They are true communal nesters. And uh, they may be the only bird in North America that regularly join nests. Uh, there may be some others where it has actually been seen once or twice in the history of ornithology. But I'm pretty sure acorn woodpeckers are the only species in North America where more than one female regularly lays eggs in the same nest cavity. Okay, these are the breeders and uh, the male co-breeders, regardless how many of them are and regardless of whether there's one or two or rarely even three joint nesting females, all the males co-breeders are competing for matings with all the joint nesting females. On top of that, you have non-breeding helpers of both sexes. Okay, these are offspring of these breeders from prior nesting attempts, okay? And, uh, but they do not participate in the nesting activities or rather in mating. 
they do help raise what amount to be younger siblings because they do help feed feed at subsequent nests. Okay, well, a little bit more. Uh, it turns out that these male co-breeders tend to be closely related. They're often brothers or sometimes, as I will get to, father and a son. Similarly, the joint nesting females, when there are them, uh, are usually sisters or sometimes a mother and a daughter. Uh, and before I go any farther, I just want to mention that at least at Hastings, 80% of groups, four out of five groups, only have one breeder female. So only 20% of groups have joint nesting females. Uh, a lot of groups have may, maybe two male co-breeders, sometimes three. Having more than that is pretty unusual. Even if there is, or what I should say is that a group can consist of any combination of these. Some groups are just one male breeder, one female breeder, a pair, if you will. You can have two male co-breeders and one breeder female. You can have one male breeder and two joint nesting females. You can have two and two. If that's the case, again, they do not pair up. Both males will be trying to mate with both females. Or you can have something even more complicated such as I show here. The point is it's highly variable within the same population and from year to year. And similarly, whether they have offspring or not, non-breeding helpers varies from group to group. You can have up to, I think we've had as many as 10, uh, but usually there's only one or two or you know, somewhere smaller number. Okay, so cooperative breeding in the acorn woodpecker, you have helping at the nest. That's these non-reproductive offspring helping their parents raise younger siblings. Okay, that's when someone, if someone ever points out another cooperative breeder to you, usually that's what it refers to. They have helpers. But acorn woodpeckers are unusual, not unique, but very unusual in that they also exhibit what I call cooperative polygynandry. And that's these two or more males and females sharing breeding status and mates within the same social unit. That's those multiple co breeder males competing for meetings with one and sometimes two or rarely even three joint nesting females. All right, so co-breeders are close relatives. They're either siblings, parents and their offspring or some combination of that. Interestingly enough, despite how complicated that is, mating is always within the group. I mean, most of you are probably aware that a lot of supposedly monogamous birds turn out to often mate with some other individual. The females often will mate with some other male. The males are off trying to get matings with someone other than the female that they're paired with. That's very common. But in acorn woodpeckers, everything is happening within the group. As far as we know, they never mate, extra, they never have any extra group mating. Okay, helpers do not pair an offspring. That's why we call them non-breeding helpers. And everyone is closely related to everyone else within a group, with one important exception that I'll get to uh, in a minute. All right, so, so far, what do we know about acorn woodpeckers? I've mentioned that they store acorns in these granaries. Everybody in the group stores acorns. It's a true communal resource. Individual birds do not have their own uh, individual stores, everybody stores in the group, and anybody in the group can take out any acorn that's stored there, regardless of who stored it. Okay, and similarly, at nests, everybody in the group, typically, or almost everybody, will feed, feed young in the nest, okay, including the helpers, the breed, you know, all the different breeders. They, for the most part, I mean, they don't really know who actually parented the young, that are in the nest, everybody in the group helps feed them. So you would, from that, you might begin to think that this is just, these groups are just one big happy family. But as most of you are aware, 
uh, because most of us are in families or would like to be in families or used to be in families or something. Uh, you know, within families, not only can there be a lot of wonderful things and beautiful, loving things happening, but you can also have some of the most diabolical competition that you can imagine. And acorn woodpeckers are no exception. And I'm going to talk about a couple ways that they uh, compete, but this is just a nice little clip that we have. This is it. Uh, we, we do have made artificial cavities on occasion. I'm not going to get into why. Uh, I will mention that the woodpeckers don't really like them, uh, but uh, you know some of them will condescend to use them. And uh, this just shows some of the competition. Let's see, let me get the Try to get the sound. Oh, well, you can get a feel for what's happening. These are three males at this nest. And they're just, uh, you know, going at it at each other. It's really kind of, here's the female coming out uh, from the nest. Uh, it just gives you a flavor for the kind of uh, competition that you can get around nesting. Um, okay. There's another bird. I'm not sure it's, uh, it's another male. There they are. They're still at it. Woo! Three males again. Uh, they just, uh, you know, everybody gets excited when it has to do with these nests. All right. Let's see if I can get to the next. Let's talk about an important event in acorn wood in the lives of acorn woodpeckers which has to do with reproductive vacancies. So we're gonna start with the group that has, let's go back to there. Uh, we're gonna pretend that these are two breeder males and two breeder females. Okay, so it's just a pretty simple group uh, of four birds, two males, two females, both, all breeders. Um, as I mentioned, they don't pair, even if they're kind of, you know, the same number like this. Both these males are going to be competing for matings with both those females. What happens when one of those females dies? Uh, and I should mention, I could do this the other way around. I could be dealing with males instead of females. I'm just going to do females mainly because vacancies there tend to happen a little more frequency for reasons which I can talk about more later on if you're interested. In any case, what happens when one of those females leaves or dies? Okay, And the answer is, well, nothing. The group just continues on. There's no vacancy. The group just continues as a trio, and both males will compete for meetings with that single breeder female who's left in the group. But now what happens if the second female dies? Now you have what we call a female vacancy. And again, you can have male vacancies, same thing. They just aren't quite as frequent as female vacancies. So now what happens? Well, you get a new female coming in or sometimes a coalition of females, sisters, usually filled by a new female from somewhere outside the group. Okay, and she becomes the new breeder in the group. Okay, so that's a simple case, but uh, that doesn't get to the really interesting uh, situation, which is when you have helpers. So, and this gets into the question of how do group, how does group, group, how do groups maintain themselves over time? And what this amounts to is what determines reproductive roles within groups? This is a really interesting question because there are two alternative hypotheses. And the one that we tend to think of more, frequ more frequently is reproductive competition competition is focused on the same sex breeders. It's saying the reason why you say as a young male are not breeding in this group, are not a breeder, you're a helper instead of a breeder is because there is an older dominant male, your father say, who's in the group and he is suppressing your reproduction, keeping you from becoming a breeder. That happens a lot in mammals in particular, and that's reproductive competition. So the focus is on, same, on breeders of the same sex. Okay, that's what's determining reproductive roles within the group. 
But in acorn woodpeckers, in a few other situations, you have an alternative hypothesis, and that is incest avoidance. The focus there being totally different, it's being on the opposite sex breeders. Again, you as a young male, the reason why you now are a helper and not a breeder has nothing to do with the breeder males who, may or, who are in the group, but it's because the breeder female is your mother or some other close relative. And if you became a breeder, you'd be breeding incestuously and for apparently genetic reasons, that's a bad thing. Right? And uh, so you don't want to do that. And so you remain a helper as long as you're stuck there with uh, the breeders of the opposite sex being uh, close relatives. So what happens in acorn woodpeckers? This, uh, so now we're going to go to a slightly different group of four. We're going to have one breeder male, one breeder female, but the other two birds are going to be helper male and a helper female, who again are going to be offspring of this pair. All right, so what happens now when that breeder female dies? Okay, and I can assure you that this now, again, that now there's a female vacancy, even though there is a female in the group, she may be several years old, perfectly competent to breed. And when I started, the default hypothesis was that she would become the breeder. That it was one of the reasons she was still in the group. She was waiting for her mother to die and become a breeder. That the reason she wasn't a breeder is because of reproductive competition. Okay, but there is the alternative, as I mentioned, which is incest avoidance. So the question is, when you have a female vacancy like this, what happens? And to make a long story short, the answer is incest avoidance wins the day. Birds inherit their natal territory only when their parent of the opposite sex has been replaced. So when she, that female disappears, she's replaced by a new female, the son becomes a breeder, a uh, co-breeder along with his father, whereas this helper female will typically fade off into the sunset. Uh, whether she's driven off by the new female or just leaves, it's uh, we actually don't know because usually you just don't ever see her again. Okay, so this is how you end up with uh, the groups maintaining themselves through time. It's also how you can get co-breeders who are parents in their offspring. Or if there is an uncle here, you would have a combination of brothers, the father and his sibling, along with one of his sons. Okay, but the point of bringing this up was that when you have one of these vacancies, they usually are not filled quietly. They're only filled after what we like to call power struggles, which are fights over the right to fill reproductive vacancies. And what they are is that non-breeding helpers from other groups converge on the territory, literally within minutes sometimes of a vacancy occurring, and they'll fight for the right to be able to fill that vacancy. Uh, they will often fight in unisexual sibling coalitions, and the largest sibling coalition will typically win the power struggle and become the new breeders in that group. Uh, these things, however, are, they're great. They can involve dozens of birds and last for days. And we consider them some of the strongest evidence we have that competition for breeding opportunities is intense in this population. And unfortunately, uh, this video, the new quick time I have doesn't have sound anymore, uh, but here's a little bit of a video clip of a power struggle. Uh, you just get these birds chasing each other. They have all these vocalizations that you don't see typically, uh, don't hear typically, rather. And the best part about this is that you'll see a couple birds chasing each other and then they'll grapple uh, and fall to the ground. And this is an interesting thing. You'll only really see, there they go. You can just see them. And, uh, there they are. In, if it's an extreme case, they will literally fall to the ground. It's the only situation where I have literally caught a bird 
by hand on the ground. When they've fallen, it'll take them a couple of seconds to get their bearings again. And if you're in just the right place, you can actually um, grab them. Anyway, these power struggles, they happen almost, I mean, they vary a lot but they can be dramatic. And if you ever hear a lot of acorn woodpecker activity, I highly recommend going and uh, uh, checking it out because it could very well be one of these power struggles. Uh, so that's sort of intergroup competition. One of the more, uh, perhaps the more interesting uh, type of competition that acorn woodpeckers exhibit is within group competition. I've talked about some of the ways they cooperate we do call them cooperative breeders because they all help feed at the nest. They all store acorns. Uh, they will all come, you know, help drive out intruders from the territory. Uh, but they have some really dramatic uh, within group kinds of competitive behaviors. What the perhaps the most dramatic of which is egg tossing by co-breeder joint nesting females. So I mentioned that if you have two or more breeder females in a group. Uh, they are communal nesters and all lay their eggs in the same nest cavity. Uh, but this turns out to not be as easy as it sounds because of egg tossing within group reproductive competition between joint nesting females. And here I have another little video clip of a bird uh, female here going in and uh, tossing an egg. Uh, they don't actually toss them. They take the egg out of the nest uh, they bring it to the to a place in the granary or some uh, part of their territory, and then they eat it. And that goes for the female that tossed it, the female that laid it, and every other group member as well. Uh, and after just a few minutes, this is literally all that's left, and they pretty much eat the eggshell as well. It's a good source of calcium. Uh, now, oh, before I get into this, I do want to mention the what, what's going on here is that when you have two females laying, two or more females laying, I used to wonder a lot how they synchronized their laying, egg laying. And the answer is, well, typically they don't. The first female to lay will invariably get those eggs taken out of the nest and destroyed by her co-breeder female. Now, until that second female is ready to lay her eggs, and then they'll both go ahead and lay simultaneously. Uh, but the really interesting part about this is that if you recall, those females are probably sisters or some kind of close relatives. So the, uh, the egg that that female has destroyed is actually a niece or a nephew. It's a relative and they're still destroying it because it's better for them to get their egg in there rather than their sisters. Okay, well, I'm gonna finish up with uh, just a tiny little uh, bit about uh, cooperative breeding, uh, just a little primer here. Uh, this is admittedly my uh, sort of view of things, but uh, you know, I think it's the right one. Uh, and I, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Uh, so, Certainly in acorn woodpeckers, and I maintain in almost all cooperative breeders, though there may be a few exceptions, breeding is much better than helping, okay? So why? Why do you get helpers? Well, what, it's because of what we like to call ecological constraints, uh, one of which at least are granaries. Okay, I've mentioned and talked about these granaries where the birds store acorns. Okay, the acorns are really important food resource in the winter when conditions get bad because you get snow or rain or whatever. And they will also use those acorns, bits of them to feed their young the next spring. Uh, you know, the woodpeckers really need to be able to store some acorns. And if there's a nice granary out there, odds are there is a group of acorn woodpeckers defending it unless the acorn crop has failed. Uh, so in either way, a bird cannot just a young bird can't disperse and, and expect to find an unused granary out there. They just don't exist. And so that is a constraint on their ability to disperse and start a group of their own. It's also possible that there are various benefits of living in the group. 
Eh, you know, there probably are. Uh, I am, as I say, do not believe that they outweigh the costs of being a helper compared to going off and breeding if you can do it. The problem is it's hard to be able to do that. Uh, so it makes this such a difficult problem to figure out you know, why they're staying, whether it's benefits or these constraints, is that the birds are constantly, presumably, assessing their options. And those options are changing depending on a lot of things. And uh, it's hard to know what those options are or how they're viewing them. So the long-term consequences are difficult to determine of being a helper or dispersing, though we're doing our best to figure them out. All right, the two different, I'm going to put this on a, I, I'm not gonna put it on a continuum, I'm just gonna kind of make a dichotomy of it. But these are sort of the alternative main hypotheses for why you would live in a group. One is that what I like to call the hard life hypothesis. And that is conditions are highly variable and unpredictable. Things are, or, you know, they're usually bad. They're often bad, or at least sometimes so bad that you can't breed successfully unless you have help, unless you have helpers to help you out. There are a few species of acorn of birds, of cooperative breeders, where this may actually be the case. But the alternative, and the one I've always liked, because, hey, I live in Upper Carmel Valley. It's a beautiful place. Conditions are great. Is that conditions are stable and predictable, leading to what I call habitat saturation. That the idea being that it's so nice that populations are just filling up the whole habitat. And so they, that's the constraint. They don't have anywhere to go, even though they would be able to do better if they had that opportunity. So the issue here in order to test these alternatives is to look at how benefits of helping vary with resources. And uh, the, the caveat, which uh, you know I belatedly had to come to grips with, is the fact that as I've already kind of mentioned, the acorn crop varies a lot from year to year and the woodpeckers are highly dependent on that acorn crop. So this is the sort of the average acorn crop of one of the species here at Hastings over the last, well, up to 2012 anyway. Uh, and you can just see how some year, basically every tree is loaded with acorns, whereas other years, there are hardly any acorns at all. Okay, the whole acorn crop at Hastings does vary a lot. And as I showed you earlier, when it's good, that's fine. The birds do really well when it's bad, well, the birds don't do very well. So even though I like to think of Carmel Valley as this fabulous, wonderful place, and it is as far as I'm concerned, if you're an acorn woodpecker dependent on, or dependent on acorns, there is this highly variable resource that you're stuck dealing with. So how does that affect reproductive success? Okay, we're now gonna look at the effect of helpers and the idea being the critical hypothesis is that under the hard life hypothesis, those helpers should have a really strong effect when conditions are bad, when the acorn crop is crappy. Okay, so what's the answer? Well, it turns out to be pretty interesting. If you look at the effect size, this is basically how much of a positive, of, uh, how much of an effect helper males and helper females have as a function of the acorn crop, these are really good years, these are really bad years. You can see that with males, helper males, they have a really important effect, strong positive effect in good years, in good acorn years. Whereas if you go to bad acorn years, they actually have kind of a little bit of a negative effect. That's pretty interesting. Whereas uh, oddly enough, helper females seem to have no particular, just a small positive effect whether it's a good acorn crop or not. All right, what does that mean? Well, helpers, at least helper males are most valuable when conditions are good, not when conditions are bad. So as appealing as the hard life hypothesis is, it doesn't seem to apply to acorn woodpeckers. Uh, it has a lot more to do 
with habitat saturation, despite the fact that you have these variable conditions. And I think a lot of that may again have to do with the granaries. Unless the acorn crop is really bad, and if you have a bunch of species of oaks, it happens very rarely, uh, they can do okay, they, you know, even if they, with just a few acorns to be able to make it through the winter. They may not be able to breed very well, but they can do okay. There are a lot of questions that remain though. If we, we don't really understand what's, what the mechanism is. Are they feeding more when it's a good acorn crop? Why are they a negative? Why are these helper males a, a, a you know, a, a, draw, a drag on reproductive success in bad years? And what about those helper females? Why does the acorn crop not seem to make any difference for how much they're, uh, what they're doing in terms of reproductive success? So there are a lot of interesting questions, despite the fact that I've spent my entire career chasing after these things. So I'm gonna end with just, a, just one little thing here, which is to mention one of the things we're, we're doing at the moment. Uh, one of the things I've always wanted to do, and this is a kind of thing that uh, you, know, you can do now because technology has changed so much in the last 40 years since I started studying these things. We can now get these little uh, radio tags, but they're solar powered. This is a little solar panel here. And uh, what you can do is you can put these on the birds. And as long as the sun's shining, it'll give out a signal, which is picked up by these. This is an old style there, of course, they've already changed completely, a base station. Uh, and it'll pick up the bird if it's within, you know, a couple hundred yards or something like that. And uh, tell you that the bird is there, basically. And so what we've done is we spread these base stations around the entire study site, put these uh, little solar nano tags on as many birds as we can uh, manage. Uh, and here's one right here, a slightly odd looking one. Uh, all right, here's one on a real acorn woodpecker and here's one of our base stations uh, to tell us how these birds are moving around in the, popula in the, in the habitat, something that we really is hard to get uh, because it's hard to know who you're watching until you can really sit there and see their legs and figure out uh, what their bands are. And just as an example, here's a, I'm gonna show you this helper that was at this one group, McRoberts. Uh, this is uh, several years ago, 2014, they had a nest. And this helper was detected at all these different groups. Uh, you know, half a kilometer or more away during the time that they had a nest. Well, what was he doing? Well, most likely we think that it didn't surprise us that much because what we think helpers are doing is that they're constantly foring around looking for those reproductive vacancies because they wanna be there to fight for them if, they have, if they're able to find one. Interestingly enough, it turns out that not only helpers, but the breeders are moving around a fair amount as well. And uh, we don't really know why, uh, though, though we have some ideas, but it's, uh, you know, we just still don't understand some of these details of their behavior. Okay, well, I think that's enough of that. Here's another one of these beautiful valley oaks uh, here at Hastings. Uh, give a Call out to uh, Berkeley, Go Bears, uh, UC's Natural Reserve System. Again, here's Hastings, right? Uh, where are we? We're probably number 16 right there. Uh, but again, there are about 40 of these things around the state now. And uh, and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and, and all the people who have helped us over the years. Okay, I can take some questions. Let's stop sharing. And uh, let's see, if I go to chat, I can find some of the questions here that people have asked, but you're welcome to, I can try to look through these quickly. Uh, but uh, if anybody else can ask if you want. Okay, I've witnessed an acorn woodpecker up in an oak tree catching a mouse. Oh, yeah, it turns out they, they can do some, they will go after bigger prey. They don't do it a lot, as far as we know, but we, 
uh, have I ever seen them with a mouse? Uh, I have been told that I have, I have reports of someone seeing them with mice. Uh, they will go after baby swallows sometimes. Uh, they'll go into swallow nests and steal the babies. Um, and what else? I think that's all I can think of offhand, but the answer is yes, they will go after small vertebrates, at least occasionally. I don't think it happens real commonly. Uh, do acorn woodpeckers raise more than one brood for season? In a good year, they can raise two, and that doesn't count the fall nest that at least some groups can have in the fall. Um, okay, this year, valley oaks are producing acorns locally. Uh, yeah, uh, valley oaks did not do well all around the state, uh, but there were some sites where they did do very well indeed. And that's one of the things I'm kind of working on now is what, what are the conditions? What, you know, acorn production does tend to correlate with uh, weather. Uh, valley oak acorn production tends to correlate with conditions in the spring. If it's wet, if it's been a wet year and there's a lot cold and wet in the spring, they tend to do worse. If it's warm and dry after a dry winter, they tend to have relatively good years. They tend to produce a lot of acorns, but it's not just that simple. Uh, that's what I've been working on for the last, uh, you know, 10 years or so. Uh, so, but that's a whole nother seminar. So we'll move on here. <laughs> okay, there it is a tall ladder. It's a 40 foot ladder that we would use to get to some of those uh, tall nests that we weren't able to climb to. Uh, how do you tell one male breeder from another? Uh, we can't other than uh, what their history is. And so basically we define, we tend to categorize birds based on if they're born in the group and their parents are still there, then they're helpers and they don't parent offspring. Uh, if their parent of the opposite sex dies and they're still in the group, then they're a potential breeder. And we do know that they can parent offspring under those circumstances. Uh, otherwise, we tell them apart by those color bands because hopefully we have uh, bands on. So females have higher mortality rate than males. Yes, they do. They do slightly, presumably just because of all that effort they have to put into reproducing eggs. Uh, but also the number of co-breeding males tends to be more than joint nesting females, presumably because of egg tossing. Egg tossing is such an energetically expensive and, and you know, difficult thing to kind of deal with uh, that, you know, as I already mentioned, most groups only have one breeder female. Joint nesting is not actually common. Well, it's regular, but not common. And so you, any, any random group will often have two or three co-breeder males, but only one breeder female. So the odds of that breeder female dying and producing a vacancy before all both or all three of those co-breeder males die and produce a male vacancy is uh, much greater. So female vacancies just tend to be much greater than male, much more frequent than male vacancies. And as a result, groups tend to be have patrilineal inheritance because the young males will inherit and become co-breeders more frequently than young females will inherit and become co-breeders with joint nesters with their females, with their mothers. What's the average territory of a family breeding unit? And eh, you know, it varies a lot. Uh, in Hastings, I think the back in the 70s and 80s when we were first following them. I think it, we worked it out to be like 16 hectares, which you're talking about 35 acres or so. That's a pretty big territory. But acorn woodpeckers have been increasing in density regularly, uh, just consistently for the last 40 years. And we now have often three or four groups in an area where we only had one group 40 years ago. So we just have uh, the territory size, the average territory size, we haven't tried to figure it out, but it's probably more in the order of, you know, four, you know, five or six or seven or eight acres, as opposed to what it used to be. 
It's just much smaller. It has to do with what the productivity, presumably, of that area is. And over the last 40 years, the, the oaks have been growing up uh, and uh, there's just a lot more productivity than there was 40 years ago. So to follow up on that, there could be most likely a, on a large, say 40 acre piece of property, more than one family unit a breeding. There's certainly good. On our little 40 acres here, before the fire, uh, I mentioned uh, our whole area, our whole 40 acres, every square inch of it burned in a fire in 2015. Uh, before that, we had one group that a couple of birds that would come occasionally over as far as I could tell. And uh, now, seven years after the fire, uh, we have, uh, there are at least four or five or six groups. There are probably at least six groups on, the, on, our, on our land. Uh, there are two or three groups right around the house and uh, there are a couple more down the hill. And uh, so, yeah, you can have, uh, so yeah, if, you, if there's six groups and we have 40 acres, yeah, you're talking, you know, six, seven acres a group at that point. So yeah, they can be pretty small when you get, they can, they can get pretty packed in under the right circumstances. Um, okay, acorn woodpeckers, they have granaries of coast live oak or interior live oaks. Do they like these acorns? I have never been able to figure out whether they, whether there is really a strong acorn preference, uh, they will store any acorns they can come across. I do know that. And uh, in a year when several oaks are available or they're all producing well, one group will store one, one species of acorn, the group next door may be storing the, another species. Uh, I've never been able to do the definitive acorn choice test. I've always considered that fairly difficult to do. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I could have done it. Uh, but eh, I have no evidence that they really care what kinds of acorns. Those acorns, they're really, I like to think of them as junk food. They're important <laughs> to have them when conditions are bad during the winter. But acorns are not a good food resource. Whenever it's nice out there and sunny, and we're in California, it's sunny out there a lot. Uh, they're out there fly catching, trying to get insects. Those insects are like 35% protein. Uh, an acorn will be you know, a few percent protein, and most of those proteins are bound up in those nasty tannins that make them basically you know, inedible to us. So, uh, you know, they are not a, a, a high, I mean, they're important. The woodpeckers, they, it's important to them as a backup food resource when conditions get kind of marginal. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you know, they would much be prefer being out there eating insects, uh, which is what they're doing a lot of the time. Okay, uh, know of any advantage to shelling acorns before storage? as Lewis's woodpeckers apparently do. Do Lewis's woodpeckers do that? That's a good question. You know, Lewis's woodpeckers, they're an interesting bird, particularly here in California, uh, because they're just so, well, here in Monterey County, they, they're around and there are a few uh, sort of resident populations, but, uh, you know, they've never really been studied in California. They've always been studied in the Rockies and places where a lot more common. Uh, I don't know, they don't store acorns like acorn woodpeckers do, of course. Uh, but, uh, you know, the acorn woodpeckers will shell acorns sometimes and store halves of acorns or part of them. Uh, but the important, the, the whole idea of storing most of them the way they do, is so they can dry while they're in those granaries, even when it's wet and you know dark and dismal during the winter. Those acorns won't, if they stay wet, if you stick them all in a big cavity or something, they'll mold and eventually become inedible. You stick them in a granary and they dry out and they can remain edible for over a year in some cases. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, yeah, I don't know that there's an advantage. There's, 
Uh, you know, if they shell, maybe it allows them to last a little bit longer. I don't know. I've never actually looked into that part of it. Um, okay, any other questions? Yeah, I have one more question. That is, um, so if you, if I have several granaries on my property, would those be separate family units or can one family unit have several granaries? Well, one family unit can have several granaries. Um, so yeah, but then they can get split up too. So uh, groups will bud off sometimes. So, you know, one of the kids, one of the young males will go next, will sort of bud off part of the territory and uh, attract the female. And if they have multiple granaries and they're real lucky, they can maybe get one of those sort of other granaries for their own. So that's part of what's happened at Hastings. I mean, again, we had groups in the old days that uh, covered fairly large areas and had, you know, a couple of good granaries. And those granaries are now, you know, being defended by separate groups. Though, again, if you have a close relative like that, a son who's just gone next door, sometimes they'll kind of go back and forth, say, you know, go back and say hello to all their, all their, their mother and their father and see how, see how everyone's doing and then go back to their group. Uh, so yeah, you can get a lot of things like that happening. And in our black oak woodland, our acorn woodpeckers come back for the insects that eat the acorns. And we noted four generations of females. Really? Well, again, they don't come back for the insects that eat the acorns. They will eat the insects that they happen to find in the acorns, if there are any there. But, uh, you know, those insects are only going to be there for a relatively short time. I mean, if they're opening a green acorn and they find an insect and find a, you know, a, 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 a beetle larvae, they'll be happy to eat it. Uh, or if they pull out a stored acorn and there happens to be still be an, a, a weevil larvae in it, they'll larvae in it, they'll eat it for sure. But that acorn, while it's stored, it's drying out. And those weevil larvae are eating and then pupating and falling down into the leaf litter. And so by the time they get back to most of those acorns, uh, most of those, the vast majority of those insects are long gone. So uh, they are not, uh, you know, yes, they will eat the grubs that are in the acorns if they find them, but that is not why they are storing the acorns. Um, and if you noted four generations of females, I, I don't know how you might, would have done that unless those birds are banded, uh, but maybe they're banded. If so, that's great. The, those females can last those generations. They will hand those uh, territories down from genera one generation to the next. That's Marty. Marty, how do you know it's four generations of females? Are you there, Marty? Marty? Uh, my husband observed that, Carl Weider. Okay, well, it's certainly possible, uh, but they are not easy to tell apart. If you watch them, you know, you, the individual birds do have a lot of little quirks. And so if you're watching a group a lot, you can pretty much tell the birds apart. Uh, but uh, this is not easily done over long periods of time, which is why we ban them all, uh, because that's the only way to be sure of what, of who's who and what's going on, and that the females are the ones you think they are. <laughs> they do look a lot alike. They do look a lot alike. You know, there's slight differences. Again, if you look really carefully, at, you know, at the same birds over and over again within a group. Uh, you know, there, there are places where the plumage will differ. Uh, mount a little bit, you know, they often have a little bit of red down here in the breast, and that'll vary, uh, you know, what exactly is going on in the crown, that'll vary. But uh, otherwise, it can be, it, it's, yeah, I would not try to rely on that. <laughs> Okay, 
Go Does beers. Anybody, yeah. anybody have any other questions for Walt? Great presentation. I learned a lot of stuff. Yeah, well, well they're interesting was, birds. That was terrific. I, I billed you to the board as somebody who knew a lot about the sex lives of acorn woodpeckers, which you might consider as an alternate title. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, one of my favorites. Uh, let's see, I have it around here somewhere. This is from many years ago. I don't know. How many of you remember Herb Cain? You old yeah. times will know Herb Cain. Well, I, one of the highlights of my, the, my career was uh, January 20th, 1983. I made the first paragraph of Herb Cain. Well, which was invitation to the annual meeting of the Point Reyes Bird Observatory on March 6th at Fort Mason. The board of directors and staff of PRBO hope you can join us. Our featured regular speaker will be Walt Koenig of the University of California's Hastings Reservation. His title is Incest, Group Sex, and Infanticide in California. <laughs> Cooperative Breeding System of the Acorn Woodpecker. You will not want to miss. <laughs> there. It's my... I love it. I'm I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I as I say, I I have friends who who claim who I didn't grow up in the Bay Area, but I had friends who grew up in the Bay Area. They claim that they know people who have spent their entire life had spent their entire lives trying to get in hurricane. <laughs> so I consider it one of my great great achievements. <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, well, thanks. It was fun. That was great. Thank you very much. Yeah.